Welcome to the first panel on big data and the cultural visitor. How can big data help us innovate? Uh, I think for starters, I will confess that when I was young, I was a big skeptic of big data or any data. When I was young, I wanted to be a writer, you know, and uh, how can you quantify the value of making someone smile or making someone cry or making someone feel? And I think when we are in the heritage spaces, the value of knowing where we come from, our identity, we know that that is priceless. Right? But in the 20 years I've worked, I think uh, I've come to a little bit more of a balanced approach where we need to communicate these things to people with finite resources, finite budgets, finite time. And we need to be able to quantify some of these things a bit better with data points. So uh, I'll introduce our three very distinguished speakers today. They have a lot to offer us. Uh, I'll introduce all three of them so when they go up to the stage, uh, it'll be kind of concurrent. I mean, uh, they'll, they'll take it in sequence. So on my right, I have uh, Ms. Gail Teo. Uh, she works in GovTech, so a government technology agency. She's an analyst in the data science division there. Her team uses machine learning, graph analytics, and data visualization, all very big words, uh, to tackle data problems in healthcare, transportation, fraud detection, and operation management. Now, she also serves as OpTech advisor for indigenous land development projects in Australia and the Philippines. So thank you, Gail. Uh, it's great to have you. Uh, our second speaker, uh, Ms. Catherine Collin, uh, head of public relations, Museum of Decorative Arts and Design. So she joined the museum in 2001, correct? So uh, she's directed both the education department and the photo library and documentation side of things. So working together with the conservation department, she showcases the beauty and significance of the museum's collections through her programs and then the digitization of her works. So she also develops projects, digital experiments to help educate the public and provide them greater access to all the museum's collections. So uh, the third speaker for today, we have uh, Mr. Kia Siang Hock, Deputy Director, Architecture and Innovation, National Library Board. Now he oversees all the IT architecture and innovation at NLB, designing, developing various innovative services that NLB provides to the rest of us. Uh, he has over 20 years of uh, IT experience in the areas of IT management, architecture, applications, systems operations, and applied research and development. Now, after reading all these three things, I'm feeling a bit small right here. So uh, I think we'll, without further ado, we invite Gail to uh, kind of show us what her paper was about. Uh, can we give her a round of applause, please? Good morning. Good morning to your distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction, Lucien. Uh, he said we use big words to describe this. This is true. Um, big data, however, is not a big word, but I'm not sure if people actually understand what it is. I hope at the very least at the end of today's conversation, you take away what parts of big data you contribute to, what parts of data you own in your organization, and then the most important thing is what do you do with that data for the purposes of your organization. So you must always think in terms of service to your given end. Now, I should introduce myself first. My name is Gail. I work in GovTech Singapore, which for our friends and colleagues who are not from Singapore, that is the implementing agency of Singapore's Smart Nation efforts. Now, I've asked all of you what you think a Smart Nation is, what it would take your country or your city to be a Smart Nation. You probably have different ideas. In Singapore, some say it's e-payments. Some say it's like China's big cashless payments on messaging. Some say that it is just never having to use cash and using Bitcoin. Now, today, at the very least, you should think about what it is in the arts and engagement space. Um, Lucien also said before, I wanted to mention this before I start. He said, we operate in a almost uh, difficult to measure space. Uh, what is culture? What is intangible culture? Why is Gail coming to talk to me about data science? And what can big data do for me? I think this is true. Yes, culture in many places and time is a very contested thing. And so with, with, when people cannot even agree on the perspective, how can you measure it? And especially so, why should you track it over time? Now, I think that when you're talking about measuring the value of art, yes, data is difficult to uh, give, shed you any insight in this space. It is also worth saying, Sometimes you have a very good question worth asking. And in that cases, what data do you need 
to answer this question. So let me jump into it. I have many examples from Singapore's public policy. We try to bring artificial intelligence and, uh, to the Singaporean public space. If you have more questions, I'm happy to take them afterwards. But very quickly, just in case you want to build your own in-house analytics team, the question is, what kinds of skill sets do you need? Uh, well, I want to focus your attention to the bottom of the slide. And it really says there are software engineers. These colleagues of mine build websites. We focus on the digital experience. So earlier, the speakers rightly mentioned things like uh, know your visitor, or 360, or digital experiences. Many of you also saw augmented reality. A lot of my colleagues in the software engineering and design space work with that. I come from a more algorithms and computational methods background, but you also need domain experts in quantitative policy and social sciences. And so you're asking me, well, Gail, what do you do? Now, I think a very basic thing is, who are your customers? Who are your citizens, as the Singapore government is concerned with? Or, as you'll see here, what is happening in Singapore and where? Now, this is a very first basic thing. You need to know the profile of the people you serve. Now, on your right, you'll see that that is a map of Singapore. It's zoomed in to show the number of citizen feedbacks on infrastructure problems we have. So in the bottom, it will say something like, one is an infrastructure problem in terms of a clogged drain. The second is a pipe that has leaked. Now at the top left, it really shows you where, where in Singapore there are many incidents. And this is really important because it's not important for you to see on a screen and sit there and have management nod. It is very important that if there is a pipe leaking, that someone make the decision to prioritize going to the first three places, if I only have manpower to go to the first three places. Now, we've actually done this in many other ways, and it's not necessarily related to public policy. But for example, in Orchard Road, or in a bustling street like shams el where are the people going? Are some of the dustbins all full? Now, earlier, one of the speakers said, it's not necessarily a great attraction if you just have many people coming to my attraction. It's also important that they have a good experience. Now, how can you know what each of us sitting here in this auditorium are experiencing right now? That's a very difficult thing to answer. At the very least, you want to know where are people and what is happening there. But that was on a very smaller, small scale. I wouldn't say it's big data yet. But what is happening in the Singapore economy? What is happening in terms of our GDP? That is usually the traditional metric of how we measure whether the economy is doing well. But what we've also tried to do in terms of big data, and this one is really big, every minute, every second of the day, what is the electricity consumption in one part, maybe an industrial estate? What other people flows through Orchard Road, which is our major tourist district? What is the port and cargo movements? All of those things together provide a holistic view of what is happening in the economy. Now, the question is, because there is money involved in the economy, there is already a very natural instinct to draw this. But if I asked you, what if I wanted to draw a dashboard called Celebrating Culture? It would, what sources of information would it have? Would it also have people flow in museums? Is that capturing the experience of people? But actually, would you also be interested on the left side, maybe jobs, application, and job ads. This tells you the size of the arts or cultural community. Specifically, maybe, how many audio technician jobs is the Esplanade or any big production house needing this year? Is there a drop from last year? How many people are actually applying to them? That information, that data, is very different from how many people were actually interviewed, how many people were hired. Now, all of these data points that we're talking about sometimes are in the public, sometimes they're not. But it is very important for you to get a sense of what you think is actually available out there. So let me give you an example. If you wanted to ask, how many indigenous musical theater plays are there in Singapore right now? How would you go about doing it? You'll say, Gail, it's not enough. It's not enough to merely count the number of indigenous plays happening in Singapore. Yes, right, we, fair. What if the character only appeared for five minutes? Is that a good enough questioning of indigenous rights 
in that part of the world in that part of the time. But is there an actual data point that will help you get at this point? So then you'll ask me, what is the point of data? Now, I, I don't have an answer for you. It's a very big philosophical question. But I think the key part is to define for yourself a question that can actually be helpfully answered with data. Answer those questions. And then decide for your parts which questions cannot be answered with data. And what do you do with that? So another example that I want to give is social media sentiments. Now, all of us are sitting here. I'm sure many of you participate in social media. The question is, what data points are you generating? And for what use are they? So I'll give you an, another example. Many people want to know what people feel about shows in Singapore. But is there a place where we know all of the shows in Singapore can be downloaded? Unclear. You could probably go on all the websites. I actually do this for my family. I download all the shows happening every day at Cystic. And then I run through, I categorize them into South American shows, Latin American shows. I categorize them by domain, by topic. And then I ask my family what they would like. And every time we realize that we've been going to the same kind of shows, then we ask ourselves, OK, can we randomize and can we go to other shows? This is almost like a recommendation engine. Many of you know that when you go to Netflix, they say, oh, you've been watching all of the same Hollywood shows. Why not watch something else? Sometimes people like that, that you are recommending something new. Sometimes people just want to watch the only thing that they find interesting. Now, so it's up to you to see what you do with that data, how your users actually engage with that. But if you have no starting point of knowing what data you have and what question you're trying to answer, then we're not even at this point. Now, I don't have a lot of time, and we have a lot of um, examples to run through. But I wanted to mention that GovTech does two specific things as examples. One is that we created an, an application on your phone. And it allows you to park anywhere in Singapore using your phone. And we log how long you've been there. So this is a very good part where we are engaging the citizens directly. But what has that done for the agencies in charge? We create for them a real-time dashboard of where Singaporeans are parking what parking lots are empty, where citizens are complaining that the gantry doesn't work, for example. And the agencies have linked this very clearly to make real-time decisions that affect their KPI. And this is a case where they found the data, or we realized we didn't have it yet because it, it was not digital. We used to use paper coupons. So we realized we didn't have the data. We made the app to collect the data. And after that, we made sure the data actually helped in decision making. And now I'm going to end here, but the last thing that I ask that you hope to, that I hope that you check out is you go to Singapore's open data website. What it is is that it gets all of the government data as much as we can, and then we make it open to the public, like yourselves. We act, it's called data.gov, D-A-T-A dot G-O-V dot S-G. And there are many data sets that are related to arts, culture. There are many that are not up there. If you would like to collaborate and write a story on data science and how data has actually helped your organization for, for the better in some way, then we invite you to write that story with us. One example can be visitor flows through the museum, but I can give, I wanted to end on a really funny anecdote relating to culture. Now, I hope that our friends from France have eaten hawker food. If not yet, I suggest you go soon. It is a big part of our cultural heritage. Now, a lot of this, is informal. So many people go and they eat. We're not actually sure uh, what foods are most popular. But one question that a, a colleague asked me two years ago was, Gail, I think dirtier hawker centers that seem to add a little more authentic seem to make the dishes more delicious. So he had this theory. He said, look, in Singapore culture, the dirtier the food, the better tasting it is. <laughs> So I said, well, that's, that's amazing. Let's go find out. Right? So two years ago, I scraped all of the food reviews on Yelp. Now, to be fair, I should caveat many things, one of which is if you're eating a $3 plate of noodles from Hawker, you're not really reviewing it on Yelp. All right? So I'll caveat that. But I took all the food reviews. I took their ratings and what people said about it. And then I went to check this against the other public information, which is the Singapore ranking for how clean that Hawker Center is. We gave them scores A, B, C, D. And it really turns out that no, 
Thankfully, Singaporeans aren't saying, look, the dirtier you are, the better tasting you are. But I think that this is a very good example of there are so many questions out there. There are many questions you can ask that may or may not fit your purpose. Find one that suits your organization's needs. Thirdly, actually collect that data. And fourthly, use that data to change how you make decisions for your organization. And that is going to be key for how you move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. Can we invite our next speaker, Mrs. Catherine Collin, uh, who will be presenting from reality to the virtual, historian to data analyst, and big data to open data. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you very much for uh, this invitation. There are um, other institutions uh, of France uh, more, uh, uh, more advanced of, uh, of this question of the use data, but uh, I hope that the specificity of the decorative arts, uh, fashion and textile, advertising and graphics, uh, design uh, will carry the initiatives uh, we have uh, been implementing. To tribute, in tribute to André Malraux, and in connective with, with our team, see a picture of the writer and uh, also minister. And can we say uh, that in front, that is in front of the beginning of our database? I don't know. It corresponds largely at, um, to, to our mode of reflections. In the imaginary museum, and Malro distinguish the metamorphosis of the work delivered from its original function. This term always joins what we convoke to the data. And Malro wanted to confuse the works of the whole world to recreate the universe. At this time, that was by photography. A flu side to, to, to work uh, from our collection to get uh, better acquainted. Uh, the museography is very detectic. The Parian room punctuated the visit. They recreated the best. And you see the Lambin chamber. And the cloud, <laughs> to evoke the cloud. And more so this masterpiece uh, since uh, the Rhinoceros Secretary of uh, François Xavier Lalanne and uh, is uh, on the scale of uh, animal, or this uh, tip ins uh, to among the smallest of uh, collection. To get uh, to, um, to the heart of the matter, this page on our website, uh, which allows to visualize our old database. Uh, virtual exhibitions, rallies in recent years, and some introduction devices. We also want to share database, it's uh, the question, and various portals, European portal, and we contribute to the Google project. With Google, we also approach the three dimension, but the uh, greatest interest in the dissemination of a collection. Museomix, uh, we made uh, the first edition. It was a challenge and the assurance that we would discover a new world, uh, Il Mondo Nuovo uh, the, of Tiepolo. The first source of innovation was to mix the profiles of participants in this kit of hackathon of the museum, hackers, coders, designers, scientists, mediators, exchanges, confidants, with all that uh, all await them uh, to create new mediation. But the uh, question quickly points out uh, of the question of safeguarding all the data. The perpetual renewals of backup at the risk of seeing them disappear. We will not be saying so much on the issues, but I like to mention the encoding of uh, synthetic DNA's uh, new storage media. Digital technology in the museum should 
should not be restricted uh, to the issue of the device, uh, but well positioned uh, as, as a way to propose a new vision of the museum, to create a dynamic of change of organization, and to integrate the issue of audience uh, at the heart of the management of the institution. Or experiments were born of the will of uh, students or startups to say the real work to increment new data. On decorative, this application with that developed uh, with, by Pierre Chiner, an artist, we do with uh, two startups uh, too, uh, deliberately intended to serve the, curiosity, the visitor's curiosity, to discover other related work, collaboration with startup is also a new and innovative way to take into account. Mixing the, the resource of the National Museum of Natura, Natural History, internet user passionate about ornithology, uh, another of our development matters sing the birds. Uh, being this piece of uh, Buffon service of Sèvres, we increment text of the natural history of Buffon, the driving of the draftman, uh, Martinet, and the songs of birds put on land by the grass of these anonymous contributors. Maurice de Camondo, the collector, spoke about over uh, we recreated it. Mutualization between in institution is a strong element of this innovation too. If digital cartels are no common place in parallel with the classic cartoon of the period room, we have set up thanks to a team mesomics a more inter interactive cartel yet. And this PIMP, the PIMP my room, this dispositive, this uh, wallpaper digitalized, uh, were mobilized to project in a real room and all possible decoration. The visitor chose on the tablet uh, and he shows his project. It's also the way to see works that cannot be exhibited. This question of uh, Data, its, ve its very name in French, data donation, constitutes a corpus of rights and duty. With artists, it's a good experience, and we have two in this uh, slide, but we have other uh, in the museum. Uh, with Albertine Meunier, uh, it connected some from words of the annotation text, uh, Babel text, we've passed on Twitter to compose her work. Linked to Twitter, this machinal, machinical dancers uh, move in the world recognized on this uh, social network. It's a little complex <laughs> to, to see. And Claire Malrieux in the uh, residence continued her atlas of the present time, uh, these abilities to the research by the scientist to turn them into random driving uh, every day uh, of the year. You see that uh, one, uh, one door uh, at this uh, day. We continue your uh, our investigation and the augmented reality has also touched us. This project is developed with the center of the National Monuments, the Museum of Antiquities of Saint-Germain-en-Laye, and a young company, Minsai, who developed such software around the HoloLens helmet. Surimposing the digital information to the very perception of our environment is a principle that offers real prospect and once again allows multiple collaboration. To conclude, I believe that the first of all innovation that interests us and this is similar with NWD Echo is uh, it's the blowing together that the digital creates. In this link of road between data produce, we can be commercial for the most part, but even more so when they are place of culture that carries them become commonplace.
Thank you very much. I think we're all very amazed at the amount of experiments that they've run and the different types of things that they've done. And I mean, just to see the, the physical space, even on photograph is amazing, to move into VR is something to look forward to. Can I invite our next speaker, Mr. Sia? Uh, Kia. Yep, no, Mr. Kia, sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, good uh, morning or afternoon, I'm not too sure. <laughs> it's it's around, uh, around lunchtime. Uh, my name is very unique, so that's why I, I think uh, uh, that, that's another kind of talking point that I always have uh, when I meet people, uh, Mr. Kia. Um, um, all right, what I will do, um, I think I have the benefit of uh, having two speakers in front of me. I think uh, Gil has actually described what big data and some of the technology stuff are. So what I will be doing uh, is to give a very short uh, a few case studies of what we did uh, in NLB, the National Library Board. Um, I actually did a workshop, a half-day workshop, on the use of big data uh, in libraries and archives in 2015 in South Africa. Uh, so this is a very short version. If you have any uh, questions, uh, that uh, more things you want to find out from me uh, about what we do in NLB for big data and generally what can be done in the libraries world, uh, you can talk to me uh, after that. Um, so just uh, a bit of um, what NLB is. NLB is not just a library. We do have, obviously, the National Library. Uh, and I have many colleagues here from National Library. So if you have questions that I cannot answer, I'll pass it to them. <laughs> All right. Um, and we also run the network of public libraries, 26 public libraries all in Singapore. And uh, since 2012, uh, two, uh, we have the National Archives of Singapore with us also. Uh, so we run this, and as you can see, um, we have really uh, a lot of touch points with uh, people. We have about close to 27 million visits to the, to the libraries every year and archives, and we, uh, we have lots of data and lots of resources that are available to the users. Okay, so what I'll do is that um, I'll just uh, zoom in on the big data, uh, we sometimes call it data analytics, sometimes call it big data, so it really depends on the theme of the, the talk. I will just change the word accordingly. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so, so pardon me, some of these uh, things that we use. Um, but if you look at it, this is an overall slide, uh, overall focus of NLB uh, in terms of what we really want to get out of big data. So I think we talk about um, big data, we should be looking at problem statements, we should be looking at what we want to get out of it, rather than hoping that big data will solve all your problem. Uh, it will surface the problem automatically. That, won't do, that will not happen. Um, so in terms of uh, what we wanted to kind of get out of uh, big data or data analytics, uh, there are a few key areas that we are focusing on. I think obviously one is to be able to plan ahead. Uh, which library should be where, uh, at what location, how big should it be, should it be in the shopping mall, should it be, in, be next to the MRT station or at the MRT station. So lots of questions that we wanted to be able to answer through uh, better foresight for, for, for future library planning. Uh, obviously the other areas are things that we are familiar with, productivity gain, better decision making, customer satisfaction. All right, so how do we uh, how do we come up with services that are more personalized? And when you want to do more personalized services, I think then you need to start to look at your data and see how uh, you can better understand the customer, specific customer, and then giving them what they need, giving them the things that they need at the right time uh, on the right device. All right, so, so that's the other area. And obviously, we have lots of resources within the libraries. Uh, our national library, our national archives are also digitizing tons and tons of content. I think um, last week when Minister was talking about the libraries during the, the debate, the, the budget debate, he mentioned about things like, for example, georeference maps. So we have now have lots of georeference maps that we paint fully or painstakingly georeference them so that now you can do a lot more analysis, overlaying and things like that. All right, so, so lots of data for us to work on it. I think uh, since we are in this space, I think there are also lots of talks about digital humanities, all right? And that is really something that can only happen now because number one of the digitized content that we are having now, and number two, 
the algorithms that are now making uh, become more and more available, the AIs that they are making things uh, a lot more intelligent, a lot more easier to work on. So digital humanities is another thing that is something that everybody is talking about. I think these are where we can play a key role on that. And I think that's why we also want to see how we can actually better improve the usage of, of the uh, resources that we all keep uh, within us. So here I'm just going to talk about two examples. Uh, number one is about recommendation engine. All right, I think they will talk about it. Uh, I think we are familiar with it. Uh, we go to Amazon.com, we go to Netflix, we get uh, uh, to have lots of recommendations uh, pushed to us. All right, many of them are quite relevant. We, we then buy another product that we didn't plan to buy. All right, so obviously there is a certain uh, 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 revenue part of the whole story, a profit part of the whole story. But uh, in NLB, we have about 30 over million uh, loans, so you all borrow 30 over million times from the libraries uh, every year. Uh, so if you look at it, there's a lot of data for us to work on. We have uh, close to 2 million people, uh, patrons, members that come to us. Um, so what we can do is really quite easily uh, look at this circulation data and recommend the kind of books that you might be interested in, depending on your borrowing history. All right. So, so it's pretty straightforward. So we look at, let's say, a particular book. Um, as an example, uh, let's say in this case, this particular book is also borrowed by a thousand other people. We then look at this thousand other people, what other books did they borrow? And they just sort it out, add it up, and then we get some kind of a recommendation engine. All right, so, so some of these things, I think uh, we are now at this stage where technology sometimes is not the issue. All right, there are many things that are available out there, uh, open source and also proprietary ones, but normally, typically, uh, you have a solution out there, you have a product out there that you can use. Uh, so with that, we could then start to provide recommendation. All right, so we push recommendations to our, our patrons when they, for example, search for a book, we can tell them these are also related to this particular book they're looking at. Um, we look at their borrowing history, and then we will then recommend to them, hey, these are the other books that you might be interested in, all right, in their personalized uh, My Library uh, space. All right, so, so that's something quite common I think everybody is interested in. You could extend this to, for example, events. All right, or your resources in the museums, in uh, other places. Uh, if when people look at this, these are the related ones that uh, people are also looking at. Uh, so when, once you start to track all these kind of behaviors uh, that your, your, your customers or the patron is kind of exhibiting, you may be able to start to provide recommendations accordingly. All right. Um, uh, I mentioned about the georeference maps, and there are lots and lots of uh, uh, digital resources that uh, NLB is building, and it is increasing. These numbers are a bit outdated, so don't shoot me. Uh. <laughs> there are a lot more now. Okay, so our newspaper, for example, there are probably about 35 million articles available. Uh, so this this was done a few years back. Um, so what? And we have lots of access to these this, uh, resources. We have, uh, uh, just from the National Library side, we have close to 20 million page views a year. Okay, so what, what if we can convert each of these access to be one where they can start to discover other related resources across the institutions, across the format, and also across languages? Right. That would be great, right? So, so it then just not doesn't become just an isolated kind of search, but it becomes a case where we start. You start to see a cluster of related articles that are pushed to you automatically. Then you don't have to start to uh, you, you don't have to spend hours and hours looking for all these things that are available under NLB. You can then start to then look at it and then kind of come up with understanding insights into the materials that we have. So, how do we do that? Um, like I say, we have millions and millions of those. So what we do first is really to use uh, analytics to help us to do this work automatically. We can't be expecting uh, every one of us to go in and do it manually. And that is just humanly impossible. Um, we take the millions and millions of uh, articles that we have, um, the resources that we have. We first of all do clustering because it's so huge. If you were to do it kind of even to computer with one whole big set without clustering, uh, it will take us years to create all this relationship. 
All right, so what we did was we did clustering. Uh, and this is this automatic clustering, so there's not much of work needed by human. Uh, if you look at some of the clusters that we have, for example, these are four example clusters. Um, each of them has about 50, 60, 100 over articles related to that particular cluster. Um, if you zoom in to look at the words, uh, these are stem words. So, so there's some kind of technology involved to kind of reduce the word to the stem uh, uh, form. All right, you see that they actually are quite related, right? You see the last one, police, arrest, suspects, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the number is high, but Singapore is quite a safe place, huh? so don't worry. Huh? It's not because Singapore is not a safe place, that's why there are so many of these articles about crime in Singapore. These are all petty, petty, petty kind of crime. Um, but what I want to say is that the clustering works quite well. All right? Automatically, it brings related content uh, together into clusters. Uh, so that's the first step we did, uh, was to cluster them. Um, but then what we wanted to do is to go even further to look at article level. So when you look at an article, I want to know which are the other articles that are related to it. So we did another round uh, of uh, doing what we call a pairwise uh, comparison of all the articles. Uh, I, I won't go through this. You can ask Gail about all the algorithms. Okay, <laughs> These are all established information retrieval kind of algorithms. But at the end of the day, for every pair, I will know I will get a number. Okay, after running it through the machines, I'll get a similarity score from zero to one. Okay, zero, one means it's uh, exact replication. Uh, resu uh, the two articles are exactly the same. Zero means totally different. All right. So for example, this this one here is zero point two nine five, for example. All right. So with that, I have a I've got an indication, uh, a mathematical indication of the similarity of two articles every pair within my collection. Uh, what that gives us is that, let's say if I'm looking at this article, I could then use the technology data mining to be able to pull out things that are related to it. I will pull out, let's say the top, I can pull out, I can pull out the top five images that I have about that particular topic. I can pull out uh, uh, oral history recordings. I can pull out other infopedia articles, maps, uh, that has that newspaper articles that has that. Uh, that is covering the same topic. So, so basically, that we are forming a, a simple knowledge graph in certain sense, so that when you look at a particular item, you, I will then push you all the rest of the articles across formats, across languages, and things like that, uh, so that you can then start to really appreciate the kind of content that we have. All right, obviously, that has pushed up the usage of the resources uh, quite significantly. All right, so I just give you those two examples. There are a lot more. Uh, so because I only have about 10 minutes, which I think I might have already exceeded. So, uh, so I'll end my, my little uh, sharing of the examples here, uh, over here. Thanks. Thank you, sir. So we shall now move into the Q&A section. We have half an hour to ask questions. Um, some of you have already put in your questions on uh, pigeonhole. I think, can we pull up the URL if it's possible again? So it's uh, phlive.at. Uh, yeah, if you're inclined to move to your digital devices, this is where you can ask questions or vote questions up and down. But I think we'll give preference to people who are brave enough to put up their hand to ask the question live. So do we have any live questions for our three speakers? Oh, there's one there. Uh, can we get her a mic, please? I think you need to pass the mic down. Thank you. Yeah, I deserve, I deserve a big round of applause because it's scary talking in front of all you people. Uh, no, no, just joking. Just, um, this is my first experience with big data. Um, I've heard about it. Um, it's kind of been in the periphery. Um, one of my very first uh, misgivings is that in order to get um, any kind of relevant data out, don't you have to feed the monster properly? And in... I guess the question is, how do you ensure that you're getting the proper food in from the stakeholders that you really are, are looking to access? My kind of question. <laughs> um, it's a very difficult. Um, any organization, I think everyone has experience with this, uh, has difficulty collecting information in a way that is sensible to you. Let me give you a really good example. Um, back in the good old days, how you code gender can be F or M. Could be female, male, could be zero, one. Who's zero and who's one? Um, 
every organization in Singapore did it differently. So for us to even know that a male at the National Gallery um, was actually, uh, what was zero and one, what was difficult. So taking data in from many different uh, sources is always, I think, the challenge. So that's why it's very key that you know what question you're trying to answer and then work backwards into the kinds of data you need to collect. Now, we are also very lucky. So after I've said that, you need to be very clear about what you want to collect and how. The second is we're very lucky. So in the NLB example, they now have this technology called Hadoop. Um, basically, it lets you deal with millions, trillions of rows, meaning how many individuals and very many pieces of information. This information can be unstructured. Now, in, in technology and data science, what unstructured means is you could say female, girl, child, and the computer will suck that in and then turn that into something understandable for you. Uh, but I think that you're absolutely right that there will remain always moving forward two challenges. One is what kind of data do you have? And second, every, organize, every organization thinks they're too late. In 2018, what am I going to do? None of the data input actually works. And I'll give another good example before I let my colleague speak. Um, Singapore has a very good uh, water ministry called PUB, they're in charge of water, but they have many cameras to see flooding in Singapore happens. Now the issue is that when they were taking data from CCTVs, the, the cameras were pointed too high. You really need to point it at the ground so that I can see water rising and then I can predict based on video analytics in the next two hours or four hours a flood in Singapore is going to happen on that road. Now the simple thing is, the camera is there, the data is there, but it's not giving me the data I need. And I think that is just a really good example of why it's so important always to just test something and start small, deliver on your pilot experiment within your organization, make sure that the whole setup works from ingesting data, analyzing it, reporting it, and then doing something to say, all right, I can change the maintenance um, people to say I need to go from location one to location two, saying that this whole pipeline works and then you go big. Hello. Uh, working right? Okay. Um, I just want to kind of add on to what you mentioned about mm -hmm. starting small. So uh, while I kind of painted a kind of a big complicated picture, um, our journey with the unstructured data analysis started with a collection called Infopedia, which is a collection of less than 2,000 articles written about Singapore, everything about Singapore. All right, so we started on that as a pilot. We ran the whole suite of the works, the, the, the similarity comparison, on this 1,800 articles at that point of time. Um, and we then got gotten our librarians to go in and check whether uh, the recommendations that's coming out from this, are they right or wrong? Are they good or not good? All right, so we started with 1,800 articles. Now we are dealing with uh, 35 million articles. All right, so, so start, so don't, so that's why sometimes I say big data, that word big is not right. <laughs> you can start with something smaller, but obviously uh, the more data you have, the more things you can do out of it. All right, just to add on to that. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, any other live questions that people might have? I see the vote counts going up on one. Oh, we can have one more there. My name is Halina Gottlieb. I come from Sweden, from Research Institute. And I think in this aspect of evaluation, it's quite necessary to collaborate with um, universities and uh, research institutes because uh, this is their agenda to conduct research. And they have a, a lot of um, already existing uh, outcomes that can be uh, available for anyone. I. Um, we started to conduct the research about uh, the use of digital media for visitors at the museum, and uh, we have very difficult to implement it to a museum in Stockholm. Our data 
was quite advanced because we, we did a lot of trajectory methods, uh, combining uh, reco recording uh, questionnaires and observations. So it was the pilot that could be developed to, to bigger size, but the collaboration was quite difficult. So I think that such collaborative uh, uh, seminars or workshops could be very good start uh, in, in such big questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comment. I have a question, if you don't mind, for uh, Mrs. Catherine. Um, you have done many, many experiments, right? And I think with digital medium, you get a lot of data back. You, 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 you can find out how many people downloaded the app or how many people used it. What data do you use to determine which experiments you want to grow and which ones you want to close? Merci, je vais continuer en français, veuillez m'excuser, mais c'est préférable, je pense. Et surtout, comme je le disais aussi, le big data n'est pas vraiment entré complètement dans les mœurs des musées. Il y a encore une volonté de bien maîtriser l'ensemble de nos données et d'avoir des contenus très certifiés qui sont le plus souvent, bien évidemment, délivrés par les conservateurs. Ça, c'est le premier point et ça rejoint aussi la, la question précédente. Donc, c'est là où nous avons... un une, de grand travail sur les bases de données et donc un enrichissement de nos propres ressources. La vérification ensuite de la validation des expériences et des, des dispositifs que nous avons mis en place, elle se mesure effectivement au regard du téléchargement des quelques applications que nous avons pu développer. Mais là encore, on revient sur cette question des sauvegardes, c'est-à-dire que ce que je vous ai montré tout à l'heure n'existe plus au regard de développements supplémentaires qui n'ont pas pu être menés jusqu'au bout. Donc ce sont des expériences qui ont euh, existé mais qui ne sont plus. Et donc le meilleur report maintenant, c'est à partir de notre site internet et des consultations qui sont faites. On est très fort pour livrer beaucoup de données. Et là encore, on revient sur cette question du open data et de cette volonté de les offrir au plus large public et de leur permettre de travailler. C'est là où je faisais mention des startups et de tout ce qu'on a envie de leur confier pour qu'effectivement, pas nécessairement en collaboration, mais au moins en travail, ils proposent de nouveaux dispositifs, de nouvelles façons de voir les œuvres. On rejoint la plateforme Google avec aussi cette force de frappe très importante de cette structure qui nous permet aussi d'avancer vers des nouveaux dispositifs. Et c'est ainsi que l'on travaille donc vers le plus grand nombre, mais avec des données que nous offrons et pas encore vraiment de travail sur les données que nous recevons et sur cette analyse des consultations de ce travail. A priori, Google pourra nous les offrir. Nous, nous n'avons pas les moyens d'avoir cette réflexion et d'avoir ce, ce travail en amont. Donc on est vraiment dans un sens de livraison et non pas de big data tel que peuvent l'entendre et le travailler les deux interlocuteurs, les deux intervenants avec qui j'étais aujourd'hui. J'avais fait part de notre retard encore en la matière. I think Mrs. Collin is being very humble in, the, in that she, she thinks there are not many projects, but there's so many things we have seen that amaze us. Uh, we'll move on to the online, one of the online questions that have uh, been very, very much voted on, if we can bring that up on the screen. So this is directed at Gail for GovTech. What kind of help and advice can cultural institutions in Singapore get from GovTech? Uh, and our cultural institutions, are they stepping up to embrace digital and take advantage of its potential? Um, what I say here stays in the room, right? <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Um, look, in every society, in France and Singapore, there will be early adopters. These people immediately understand the value of new technologies. Now, and it's not always useful or good. So I would say the early adopters find it most difficult to f get useful use cases, uh, be cost effective, in, in, in adopting new technologies. Now these are the very, these are the pioneers, they lead the way. Every society will also have the bulk of it. And now the question is, do you focus your energies on pushing the top up or in bringing along the whole base with you? 
right? And I think this is up to your society and your organization to decide. Um, GovTech takes the philosophy that we are happy to share, always. In fact, uh, we try to do both at the same time. So we train some of the very best. Some of my colleagues are brilliant, not me. I'm very fortunate to work with these people. The kinds of algorithms they use are cutting edge. They take what comes out of uh, machine learning conferences in the US or Europe around the world, and we try and use them for use cases to the best clustering algorithm, for example, uh, uh, on Singapore corpus or text corpus. Now, the second thing is we try to democratize data science in the whole of government. What does this mean? GovTech will train 10,000 public offices in data science in the basics of how to use data science. So what kind of help and advice? It really depends on what the cultural institutions need. Um, we work with a, a few. I, I wish we worked with more. Um, maybe this is a good starting point to have that conversation. Now, what kind of advice and help? There are policy questions. What kinds of arts uh, consumptions and creation should Singapore work with? Is that even a question that uh, should come from the public sector? Uh, second, what kinds of service deliveries can we help improve on? These work with museum flows, these work with who are the kinds of audiences that get access to certain kinds of shows, and who are the audiences that are not getting access, or what kinds of cultures, uh, what kinds of stories are not being told in our cultural institutions? Uh, those questions, I think, are all questions that if we had data, GovTech is help, happy to do the pipe, to help with the pipeline, which is collecting the data um, and then doing the analytics. And, and I want to end off with saying that the key part is that the cultural institution must want to find out more, and it doesn't need to own all the data. You will never own all the data. You need to ask the right people for the data. So for example, uh, one very obvious one is cystic. They know all of the shows. They know what kind of rows I always sit in, that I always sit in the aisle. They know that I tend to watch any domain, dance, musical theater, and they know what, that I'm more open, maybe, to, um, to watching shows from other domains. Now, the question is, uh, I'm sure it would help their business to, to, to do that analytics, but I'm also sure that it would answer many questions that uh, we have within society about the kinds of arts that Singaporeans are creating and consuming. So I guess to end off is that um, I don't want to say we do it all, but GovTech is happy to help where we can. And I will say that we always start small. So we start with small pilots. I really wish GovTech was around when I was in the public service. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, I have this a question for uh, Mr. Kia. Um, let's see. Let's pull that up. So I think people want to get a sense of the scale of your project because you're clustering thousands and millions of pieces of information. Yep. Um, we, we, um, uh, I'm just trying to recall because that was uh, done uh, uh, some time back. Um, for, uh, let me start, for let's say a cluster of about 2,000 that I mentioned, the Infopedia articles, that can be done within seconds. Okay, uh, on a little notebook. All right, so that's where we started. We started a pilot on a little notebook. Uh, we installed the software there. We run with 2000, that works well. Um, each of the clusters I mentioned, uh, about 50 to 100,000, 120,000 articles, that can be done within minutes. Okay, uh, but again, it all depends on the kind of hardware that we run on. We actually run uh, 16 server clusters, so there are 16 uh, machines running at, at any point in time. All right, so so uh, just giving that scale of, of, of what can be done right now. Uh, obviously, we have millions of those that are broken into clusters of 50 to 120 over 1,000 in terms of size. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, how big is the team? Um, well, there isn't really a dedicated team. Okay, that that happens not just in the IT side; it happens in everywhere in NLB. Okay, we have many things that we do. So, um, so the the team actually uh, did that as part of their many many projects that they do. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to move into I think a very interesting question that we have. 
bit data tracking is useful for policy making, hashes are anonymous, but are there privacy concerns and how can they be addressed? I think this is something we all in big data need to, to think about. Um, anybody wants to take first stab at this? I'll, I'll buy them some time, all right? I mean, I think we've seen a lot of technology come into museums and spaces that we've never seen in the last 10, 20 years. I was just thinking if we could have microphones on, on museum spaces that capture how many times the word wow appears, <laughs> we'd get a sense of which ones are great and which ones are so-so, right? Right, but there are privacy concerns, of course. You know, but imagine all the data we could get and what we could do with it, yeah. Um, actually, the problem is actually much broader than just privacy. Uh, once, you, once you talk about uh, some of these things that we have to think about when we look at big data, um, there are also lots of biases that are built into the algorithms, built into the engines and things like that. For example, uh, when we did our video analytics uh, system, pilot, pilot, okay, pilot. Um, those were trained not using Asian faces, right? So obviously, so many of the engines are trained outside of Singapore. Um, so even my text analytics, they will not uh, by default understand what is Serangoon Road. Uh, the local terms are all not there. Um, so, so be very careful uh, of all these engines that are trained uh, because you may have to retrain them uh, so that it becomes something that is localized in Singapore. Uh, IMDA, for example, right now is working on a national speech corpus that is able to help to improve the accuracy for speech to text recognition uh, by incorporating Singapore local terms. So, so that's one example. Uh, and, and I think more need to be done on that in order to remove some of the biases or to increase the accuracy of some of these uh, algorithms for Singapore context. Um, there are also other, so, so it leads to some of these ethical issues and things that if the engines are recommending something that is biased, then what do you do with the results? Um, so I think there are many, many, many incidents cited overseas. So that's one thing. Machine learning, uh, you can teach the machine the wrong thing too, right? So there was a chatbot that somebody put up that started to learn the wrong thing, all right? Because they learn from interaction with people and they started to wrong, learn the wrong thing. All right, so the company has to shut it down, right? Because it's just not too. Uh, uh, so, so I think privacy is one part of the, the many many things we need to worry about. So, so when you go inside a big data project, I think we need to think about that part too. Mrs. Kong. And I think it's also our responsibility. I was talking about rights and duties to show the reality of what are these big data also within our institutions et d'informer le plus largement possible. Et si on prend l'exemple du waouh et du nombre de, de, euh, de, 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 de ce plébiscite qu'on pourrait imaginer pour certaines œuvres, une des équipes de, donc de Muséo Mix, de ce grand hackathon dont je parlais aussi, avait imaginé qu'on pouvait avoir une puce auprès de chaque œuvre et qu'à la fin de la journée, il y aurait un taux de mesure de celle qui aurait été le plus vue et de celle qui aurait été le moins vue en allant jusqu'à « venez donc me voir parce que personne ne m'a regardé aujourd'hui », enfin avec tous ces éléments. Donc plus on fera rentrer ces éléments, ces big data, plus on montrera qu'effectivement, il y a vigilance à avoir, il y a attention à donner. On a suffisamment de débats sur ce que sont les données qui sont révélées, sur la façon dont on a ce droit de retrait ou pas. Voilà, c'est aussi de notre responsabilité d'institution de manifester ce qu'est ce qu le numérique pour et donner envie et donner confiance et en même temps alerter sur ce que provoquent effectivement toutes ces collectes de données. Voyons le côté positif de ce qu'elles révèlent des œuvres et du partage qui est organisé maintenant au niveau international et soyons dans cette belle attention à chacun, donc dans cette révélation de ce que sont les données. I want to be very honest about what technologies enable big data tracking. Um, but the first thing I want to say is that any government should take its responsibility very seriously um, in safeguarding the individual's privacy, and second, in deciding how it shapes the state of surveillance in any society that now has the technology to do so. 
Okay, um, one example is where I went to college, they had a public camera of the whole school when you walk past this uh, science center garden. And I took the video live feed and I kept it on my computer. And also my college had a student Facebook. I knew every student's face. I also knew because I was friends with you, what you liked, um, how you looked like, who your friends were. In essence, based on your historical path of walking through school, I knew where you were going to be. If you're going to be outside my dorm in the next two hours, I could predict it, and then I could strike up a conversation with you and pretend that I didn't know. Um, this is in my college, and it's free and open data, um, and was fun for me to do. Now, I want to say that I take my responsibilities as an analyst very carefully, but I don't base this on how much you trust me. It should not be that you trust me a lot, therefore you give me this data. Um, I think that within any government institution, there must be safeguards. That if I were a rogue analyst, I couldn't get to the data of the person sitting in front of me. Now, that being said, I also think that, um, that, that the conversation debate of any society needs to be very mature about what surveillance and tracking is. There is a technology, and what you do with it depends on the use case, the people who do it, and, and the outcomes, and also perception of those outcomes. Um, I, I think we could have a very long conversation about this, um, but I think one thing that's very important, I want to give also a good example. <laughs> My grandmother is 100. She has uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. She walked out of the house, and we couldn't find her. We have no tag on her. Um, we could imagine a world in which all the CCTVs around Singapore could have been looking for my grandmother's face, the way my school camera had everyone's face. Um, then you will need to think about the legal issues of storing my grandmother's face with or without her family consent on every camera. Should it be at the camera level? Should it be at the centralized government level? Um, but the fact is these are happening. I will end off with saying that Australia allows you, uh, has a pilot that allows you to pass immigration with a mere facial recognition. And of course, China has CCTVs around uh, that do facial recognition uh, algorithms. And for sure, I know that right now all of us sitting here could scrape the daily news and count how many times our ministers turn up on Channel News Asia and what they talk about. So this is something you should think about as you go back. And I think there is no fully formed opinion on this today. All right, we're coming near the end, but I'd like to take maybe one last live question, if there is one. Anybody has any pressing questions? Or is this privacy conversation kind of spooked us a little bit? <laughs> right? I mean, with any technology, there's always a plus side and a negative side. I think we do need to be, uh, like you say, very responsible about it and very open and transparent about how we use it. I think those things are really, really important. Um, I think if not, we can, we can end here, right? Yeah, so thank you very much to the three speakers. Can we give them a round of applause?